you need you the authority to preach, to teach, to, to talk to people. And, and you're talking about Jesus, the guy that we killed because we didn't like his teaching. What are you doing? You're going to cause a tumult. So they arrest them. They throw them into, into, into prison. And that's where we find here, verses 1 through 4. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So, get this in your mind that Peter and John, you know, they just, this dude just gets healed and he's jumping around. Everybody who went to the temple, every day they went to the temple, saw this man. All right? He was like the fixture. Like some of you guys, if you, if you work downtown or you travel in the city at all, you'll see the same homeless guy or gal there every day with the same sign asking for money. This was that guy, right? But instead of it just being, you know, I've got my sign and I'm walking around pacing the corner, he's literally laying there because he, he can't walk. He has no strength in his legs, and it's been this way for 40 years. And for every day for 40 years, you walk by and you see him, and he's the laying beggar. And then all of a sudden, you come to the temple, and this dude's jumping and shouting and praising the Lord. And there's a crowd gathering, and they're like, what happened? And this, this guy, Peter, just prayed for him, and, 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 and he got healed. And his leg was made whole and straight and strengthened. And I'm sure there's some people who are like, no, he's been full of it for 40 years, man. He's been trying to scam us. Or the rest of everyone's like, what? This guy just got up for the first time in 40 years and is walking and praising. God is good. And they're talking about this guy named Jesus. And man, 5,000 men get saved. And this is just like in the Gospels. We talk about the feeding of the 5,000, feeding the 4,000. They're only recording the number of men. So there's more. There's women in there. There's everybody getting saved, man. It's a good day to be in Jerusalem. Now, if we notice that the, the, the priests and the, the Sadducees, who are the reigning people on the council at the time, the Sadducees, just for you, if, you, if you're not aware of who they are, they were a reigning group of religious leaders who did not believe in a physical resurrection of the dead. They were deniers of any kind of physical resurrection. Here and now is all we have. And all of a sudden now you've got these untrained, ignorant fishermen preaching about a resurrection? No, we're not putting up with that. Get the captain of the guard, get some guys down there, arrest them, get them out of there before they start spreading this, this ridiculous propaganda about a resurrection. Come on, people don't get raised from the dead. We know more than that. We're smarter than that, right? Well, that's what happened. And then Peter and John find themselves before the very same council that tried and convicted and murdered Jesus. So we pick up here in verses 5 through 12 now. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name had he done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people, of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which, the, which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given by, among men by which we must be saved. Peter just said a lot, and he just laid it out. He said, they're, they're asking, when they say by what name, and we see that through that, that, that passage in, in the New Testament a lot, in whose name, in Jesus' name, in what name, by what name, all that means is under whose authority, by whose authority, in which and whose power do you do this? You know, we, we use this phrase in the modern language too, we stop, stop in the name of the law. Right? It's not like the word law is chasing after them. It's in the authority. When a police officer says it, it's by the authority that is given him. Stop in the name of the law. So that phrase indicates authority, power, control, ability. It references back to the person in whose name you're operating. 
Well, the person named Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Son of God, he has all power, all authority, all ability to heal, teach, save, etc. And Peter is saying that by his authority. And earlier in chapter 3, he's talking to the crowds and says, why are you guys looking at me? Why are you guys looking at John? Like we, in our holiness, in our righteousness, did anything. It's not by us. It's not by our power. It's by the power of Christ. It's his power flowing through us. And we've been talking for weeks and weeks and weeks about the power to witness. The Holy Spirit does. The power to witness about Jesus. And that's the key, wrapping it all together. The power to witness about Jesus. The authority to witness about Jesus. The, the ability to witness about Jesus. Now, if you guys remember your, your Bible at all, Peter, several weeks ago, in front of the same council, was running from a 13-year-old girl. She confronted him. Aren't you, aren't you one of his followers? No, girl, get out of here. I don't know what you're talking about. And then she presses him again and he starts to, you know, I mean, you're a tough dude when you're, you're cussing out a 13-year-old girl because she's intimidating you. That's Peter, right? Several weeks ago. Now, he's before that same council, the same people who murdered his uh, teacher, murdered his God, murdered his, his Lord and Savior, and he is confronting them now with boldness, with power, because now he has the spirit of power within him. He has the Holy Spirit. Now, the statement that he ends that section with, nor is there any name, any other name given under, I should probably read it because I don't have it memorized, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. That statement not popular. It was not popular then. It is not popular now. 50 years from now, it will still not be popular. That is not something that people want or like to hear outside of Christians. Now, inside Christianity, inside the church, we're like, yeah, amen that, only Jesus. Why? Because we know the goodness of our Savior. We know the, 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 the love of our God. That it is through Jesus. And if it was through anyone else, God the Father is not a loving father. If I murder my son for my enemies, but there's another way to do it, I'm pretty messed up. I'm pretty sadistic, in fact. But if that is the only way to bring my lost children back to myself, and I do it, I am a good God. I'm a loving God. I am a God who cares even about my enemies. But this statement will cause you no end of trouble if you walk around today and you proclaim that Jesus is the only way to salvation. You want to get into a fight real quick? Tell someone that the religion that they believe in is false. Tell them that the, the God they don't believe in is the only way to salvation, the only way to heaven, the only way to eternal life, and they will resist you. Now, I would not recommend going up to someone who's like, let's stop, so you're, you're a Buddhist, right? You know you're worshiping a demon. You know you're burnt hell. You're a terrible person. That's not really the, uh, the appropriate way to, to minister this word. This word is one that has to be tactfully approached in love. Now, Peter does it in some boldness here, but I would not recommend everyone to get, we're talking about descriptive and prescriptive text, don't go in front of your boss or your, your mayor or, or someone that you don't really know, but they have all kind of authority and power over them. They're like, yo, you're a sinner, and you're going to burn in hell unless you get your, you know, get your life right with Jesus. Got to get saved in Jesus' name. And that's the only way. They may not receive it well. But your family members, for example, whom you have a relationship with, hopefully, you can tactfully and appropriately go to, look, 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 look. I know, I know you're dealing with this, or I know you, you think this is the way, I know you think this is right, but let's, don't take my word for it, let's see what the word of God says. Because God has spoken to his people through his word, and he has given us all the knowledge I know you're, you're off on this Scientology thing. I know you're off on this Mormonism thing. I know you're off on this Islam thing. I know you're off on this Buddhist thing. I know you're off on this Hindu thing. I know you're off on this philosophy thing. I know you're off on anything. There is only one name given among men. Okay, that qualifies everybody. So unless you're like a space alien or an animal, your only chance of salvation is Jesus Christ. Okay? Now my question to you, and this is a difficult question to pose to you, and it's going to be an uncomfortable question. So I'm going to brace you now. Prepare to be offended, potentially. Do you believe that lie with all of your heart? With all of your soul? With all of your mind? That there is no other way to salvation than Jesus Christ? Now, 
It's really easy when we're all in the church stuff. You know, my, my brothers and sisters ask me, yeah, Jesus. Now, when you're one-on-one -on -one with your atheistic friend, or you're one-on-one -on -one with your, with your uh, Jehovah Witness parents, and you start saying, Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, is the only way to salvation, do you believe that enough to continue saying it to them? When they kick back and say, no, 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 I don't think that's pretty exclusive. Uh, that's, that's not very tolerant to only have one way of salvation. All religions are equally valid in the sight of God, right? Many paths to the same destination. Okay, and I'll say there are many paths to the same destination outside of Christianity, but that destination is hell. Because there's a whole lot of other options besides Jesus, but they all end up in one spot. Jesus is the only way unto eternal life and into heaven. And that's not my word, so if you don't like that, take it up with God. It's his book. I'm just a messenger. Right? But if we truly, truly, truly believe this lie, man, do we have an awesome responsibility. Okay? It just got super light. I mean, I know the air conditioner kicked off, but it got cold before the air conditioner kicked off. <laughs> right? This is a sobering thought because at this point, if I really believe this, I have a moral responsibility to tell people about the name of Jesus. I have a moral responsibility to not hold this back. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to upset the apple cart. I don't want to do it. Whatever phrase, catchphrase, the line you want to use, I don't want to do it because it makes me uncomfortable. I don't like Who likes confrontation? Who, likes, who relishes? I mean, John, I know you love just confronting people. You're like probably the only one either. <laughs> no one really likes confrontation. We don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable. So when, when we think about it, we're put in a position where we are going to be confronting someone about false ideas, false religion, false truth. It makes us uncomfortable. That is why we need the Spirit of God. You try to do this on your own. You try to do this in your power. You will screw it up. You will offend someone. You will tear someone down. You will say the wrong thing. But by the grace of God, he gives us the words to speak. I want to reference Matt, or Mark chapter 13. There's three different um, stories like this in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus says that effectively, when the time comes, when you're dragged before people, the Spirit of God will give you the words to speak. Don't worry about it. Anyone ever even worry about like, What am I going to say to someone? Like you start, you start playing out all the scenarios. Like, all right, if they say this, I'll respond with this. And if I say this, then they're going to say this, and then I'll respond back with this. And we kind of work out these, these grand schemes and all these plans. This is how this conversation is going to go. And then you have the conversation, and it goes like a completely different direction. You're like, oh man, I didn't, I didn't plan for that contingency. I got to go back in time, and I got to plan that one out my head, right? We get freaked out, stressed out, anxiety. Jesus says in Mark chapter 13, verses 9 through 11. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So, Whenever we find a text like this, what I don't want people to look at is I don't want them to look at it like, oh, well, the Holy Spirit's just going to take over my mouth, and he's going to start running my jaw, and he's just going to do everything for me. No, he won't. Okay? The Spirit will speak through you, but he will not control you. You are not a puppet. Right? And one of the things that I have in, my, in, in, in studying and everything, I have come to realize that if you do not know the Word of God, what is the Spirit going to draw on when you're in this position? When you're talking to your friend, they're saying, I don't, I don't think that you're right. I don't agree with you about Jesus. I don't think he's the Son of God. I don't think he's the only way. I think my New Age pantheistic spiritualism is just as good as your Jesus. Well, where's your argument with that? What's the Spirit going to draw on? And I mean, I'm not saying... I'm not saying that the Spirit of God can't just, like, drop truth into your mind and then you convey that out, but I would not expect or rely on the Holy Spirit to give you, like, a full four-year seminary degree in that instance to be able to speak against pantheistic spiritualism, right? We have to know what the truth of the, the Bible says and what it is, and we need to know this theology before we come into those situations so that we have something that the Spirit of God can bring to memory and speak out through us. Last week, right at the very end, I had like a whole like page of notes on, on this one subject of being theologically thin, and I didn't get to it because I just kind of got away from me. 
But I want to kind of address that, that this is a, this is a tremendous problem in the church today. We have become theologically thin. We don't know much about God. But man, let me tell you, if you need a, a scripture verse on a coffee mug, I got your scripture verse for you. I got that little, that little verse memorized, and that's what I base my entire theology on, and, and that's not good. Because when the going gets tough, and when people press into you, and they test your theology, and the only verse you have memorized is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and you stop halfway through the verse, that's not a lot of depth to draw from, okay? But the other danger with being theologically and this is something that, that has literally, I mean, I, I talk like I actually like know all this stuff. I've only really discovered this in the last year when, when the, the rubber met the road and when you're un, enduring suffering, when you're going through uh, circumstances and trials, nothing will reveal either your trust in Jesus or your complete lack of knowledge about God than when everything you thought you knew gets turned upside down. Okay. In the last year, everything I thought I knew about God, because you know, I read that, I studied, I, I, was, I was instructed for eight years by a phenomenal man of God. Everything I thought I knew about God seemingly got turned upside down last year when my father-in-law passed away from cancer. And I was left either, either, either something's wrong with God or something's wrong with what I believed about God. And it doesn't take a theology degree or a seminary student to figure out who's wrong in this equation. So I had to revisit everything that I believe, every reason why I believe, everything I thought I knew about God to get at the core of why did this happen? Why did suffering happen? Why are we going through these trials, right? And only to have God reveal, man, you, you don't really know all that you think that you know until you really know me from my word. And there's a great difference, and I want this to say, there's a great difference between knowing what the Bible says and knowing God from the Bible. Let that sink in. There's a difference between knowing what the Bible says and knowing who God is from his word. I realize I said, well, it doesn't really work. Yeah, it's just the general thought. I can have scriptures memorized, I can know concepts in scripture, but until I know the God who authored those concepts, or until I know the, the God who is behind those scriptures, they're just words to me. They're just thoughts to know. But when you begin to apprehend the author of those words, he will reveal things to you, and he will put a deposit in you of his truth that is then unshakable. Okay? Peter and John spent three and a half years, roughly, under the ministry and discipleship and mentorship of Jesus Christ. You want to talk about an awesome teacher, you want to talk about the best fast-track degree you can have, live and eat and sleep and walk around with in your bare feet, we're saying, for three and a half years with the Son of God, okay? But also know that in their walking around for three and a half years with the Son of God, whenever you would present a hard teaching, a parable, Peter was like the first one to come up to like Jesus. Jesus, all right, let me, let me ask you something. Not me, but someone I know is questioning what you said in this parable. I mean, he's a little confused about the, the seed and the sower and the birds coming. I mean, not me, Jesus. I got, I got it, man. I know everything that you're saying. But this guy, in our group even, he doesn't get it. Can you explain it to me? Okay? They didn't grasp everything. And then when Jesus resurrects from the dead, he spends 40 days with his disciples. And we look at the story of, uh, of the road to Emmaus. And two of the disciples are walking. And it says that Jesus, starting in Moses, went through the entire Old Testament, revealing himself to them in the scriptures. He started in Genesis. Went all the way through the law, the prophets, the wisdom literature. Like, oh yeah, Job 24, 3, that was me. Psalm 22, that whole psalm, yeah, that was me. Everything. The prophet that Moses said would come would be greater than him, and that was me. He just reveals everything and teaches and teaches and teaches. And they didn't get it all even when he was saying, I guarantee you, because we're finite 
finite human beings, and you can have, you can have, you know, Jesus instructing you, and you're, oh, I get it, I absorb it, I absorb it, but you don't necessarily keep it or retain it. That's why it's an ongoing walk of studying our Bible, an ongoing, every day I want to apprehend truth, every day I want to get the scriptures, because I can't just read it once and done. Oh, man, I read the Bible once. Who's read the Bible? All the way through. Raise your hand if you read the Bible all the way through. All right, yeah. Give me uh, the... No, I'm not going to go there, because that's just going to be... That's going to be bad. So, let's just look at this one. You can read through the Bible in a year and miss so many things. You can read the Bible multiple times and miss whole theological concepts. All right? I read the Bible for years trying to find myself in the Bible. I'm the hero. Jesus saved me. Where am I in Scripture? You know what the answer is? You're not in the Bible. You're not the hero of Scripture. Jesus is. All right? Now, my challenge, my, my, the challenge that the Holy Spirit extended to me, we'll put it that way. Reread the Bible, take yourself out of it. Read the scriptures, and find Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Look for the true hero of the Bible in all those stories. Right? I, great illustration, this is not mine, so don't think that I'm this fantastic to come up with this illustration. But, David and Goliath. Who's David? You're not David. I was, I, I'm David, right? I mean, he's got a sword. He's killing dudes. He's like chopping off Goliath's head. He's the hero. He fights. He wins. That's awesome. I want to be David because God made me like David. Give me strength. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer, right? All those scriptures I can rattle off and point them to myself. But really, they point to David, the true David, Jesus Christ. I'm the Israelites. I'm the guy in the corner crying and wetting my pants because there's a nine foot tall giant saying he's going to murder me. That's us. We're Israel. Jesus is David. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the one who's the conqueror. Jesus is the one who's more than the overcomer. Jesus is the victor. He is the warrior. He is the king of kings. He is the one that the story points to. Now, before y'all get depressed and you're like, oh God, I can't read my Bible. Like, ruin the Bible for me. I didn't ruin it for you. God ruined it for you. Okay? All he did is reveal that our priority is twisted sometimes. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about finding Jesus in the scriptures. So I challenge you, reread through the Gospels. Look for Jesus in the Gospels, right? He's right there, right? It's kind of, kind of obvious. Jesus, the Gospel's all about him. But don't insert us. Don't insert our problems. Don't insert 2017 into the Gospel. Read the Gospel for what Jesus says specifically. You will face suffering. No, Jesus, you're just kidding about that. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to suffer, right? You will face persecution. No, 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 no. Jesus, you fulfilled that on the cross. I don't have to do it. You will die. Nobody likes that one, right? But guess what? You're all still going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die at some point unless Jesus returns. We tend to whitewash out those passages and look for the ones, I don't need all your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Those are all true. Those are all good. That's not the point of those passages. The point of those passages is for us to reflect on the fact that Jesus is sufficient for everything. He is our everything. He is our anchor. He is the name that all nations must know to be saved. That's hard. It's difficult. I see a lot of faces that don't like that. That's okay. Because a year ago, I was, I was right where your face is right now. But let me tell you, you pursue the scriptures like that, you pursue finding the hero of the book and not myself, and he will open up a world of understanding that I can only relate to when the disciples were on the Emmaus Road, and it says their hearts burned within them when Jesus revealed himself in the scriptures. Man, it is so much better to read the scriptures looking for Christ rather than looking for myself. Because I make a lousy savior. I make a lousy focus. I make a lousy idol. But Jesus is a good, good God. Okay? So my challenge is re-interpret. I don't want to say re-interpret. That's, that's a dangerous word right there. Re-examine the scriptures with a different focus. Re-examine the scriptures saying, Jesus, where are you in this? What is, your, what is the truth about you you're revealing? Not the truth about me. I want you to tell me who I am. I don't want to tell myself who I am. Does that make sense? Everybody got that? I mean, this is hard. This is, no one likes this. And there's, there's a lot of frowning faces right now. But turn that phone upside down. Okay? Because Jesus is good. All the time. All the time. We all stink. But he is good. 
Let's continue on in Acts. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. I'm going to stop right there. This is good news. I don't have a seminary degree. Oh. Right? Big shock. I don't have a theology degree. It's okay. It's okay. I had the best teacher on earth that I could have, and I had the best teacher spiritually that I could have. I had my father on training for eight years to, to interpret the Bible, read the Bible, send the Bible, no more, and I got the Holy Spirit within me. Now, all of you didn't have the blessing and opportunity to live in that man's basement for seven years and study under him every day and run down the hallway like, hey, 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 I got this question. Can we talk about this? Let's talk about dispensationalism. Oh, well, let's talk about this. Talk. No, you guys didn't have that. So, you know, are you at a, at a, a detrimental loss compared to me? No. No. No, because we're, we're, we're all Israel, remember? <laughs> they're, they're, the idea is, though, and this is the big picture that I want to get, Peter and John, did they get what, a degree from First Jerusalem Seminary? You know, First Baptist or whatever? No. They were untrained men. Not that they were incapable, not that they were dumb because they were fishermen, but they spent their time catching fish. They didn't spend their time exegeting the book of Habakkuk. Okay? Now, Paul, on the other hand, Paul was a trained man, Paul was an educated man. Paul could have walked into this Sanhedrin council and probably proved every single one of the Sadducees wrong by quoting from memory the Old Testament minor prophets. Because he was trained. Okay? There are guys that I listen to who use words that have like six syllables. Do you even know a word that has six syllables? I didn't know they existed. I can't even pronounce them. Okay? Infrusilitarianism. What? It doesn't matter. I don't need, is that six? Not, oh wow, I'm like really blown away then. Okay? I don't need to know that kind of knowledge. I need to know what Jesus said about himself. Okay? That's the knowledge that Peter and John are drawing from. Jesus basically said, what Jesus did say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, when Peter takes that truth that he learned from Jesus, the Holy Spirit brings it to mind, and he speaks it out to the, the Sadducees and the rest of the Sanhedrin and the council, and he says to them, you are all lost, but by the name of Jesus Christ, you can have salvation. Okay? He conveys the truth that he learned through his time with his mentor, his time in Bible study camp, as it were, when Jesus resurrected and started preaching truth. It is important for us to find people that we can we can sharpen ourselves with people who know Scripture or people who, who have studied Scripture or people that we're just reading the Bible together. Neither of us have a seminary. My wife and I, man, we have, some, we have some intense theological debates around the breakfast table. Like Elliot's eating his oatmeal or his, his, his granola, and we're, we're debating the doctrines of predestination and election, and it's like 7 a.m., all right? Neither one of us have a seminary. I nerd out a lot more than she does because I'm a nerd and I like to study and like to read. And I have like my, my when I go to work, I have like my podcasts that I listen to. I go through a bunch of uh, theology lectures and everything just because that's like, why listen to the radio when you can talk about any words I can't even pronounce, right? Because that's what the best thing to do on your drive to work is, right? But we have these discussions and we have these debates because it's like, well, why do you believe this? Where, what's the scripture for that? Where's your proof for that? Let's talk about this. Well, could it be this? Could it be that? Could this? Could the text mean this? And it's just this, this, you know, Proverbs talks about iron sharpening iron. And we're just sharpening one another. And the idea is that I want to know why I believe what I believe. And I want to know that it's coming from the Bible, not what I want the Bible to say. And not what I think the Bible says. And, and I want to, to, to be able to explain these things to people in ordinary language that's not nine syllables long. And that's important because the people that we interact with, the people that we talk with, they're not all PhD level theologians. They're the mom in your preschool group. They're the, the blue collar construction guy that you're working next to. And they all need to know that Jesus is the only name under heaven by which man must be saved. And it's not should be saved or could be saved. It's must be saved. 
right? And you need to believe that with every fiber of your being, that if we do not preach the gospel, people go to hell. And that should be sober. And that should be concerning. And we don't have to like, yeah, people go to hell, that's awesome. It's not something we take joy in. It's something that convicts us and say, man, I've got to come there. I've got to talk to people. i got to, i got to, next week we're going to be talking about boldness. And I like to, I like to think of myself as a bold person. You know, like, so I'm like David, you know, I'm the warrior. I'm going to shoot that slingshot and cut off God. I like to think that, but then when the question comes, is Jesus really the only way to salvation? Gut check, immediately. Because I don't want to offend. I don't want to confront. I don't want to cause people discomfort. I'm a human being. Most human beings, most normal human beings, I should say, don't want to cause those discomforting situations in people. But God has called us to be more than just a normal human being. He's given us the power to overcome, the power to cast out any argument that exalts itself against God, the power to be bold witnesses for Christ. Doesn't, I don't care what your education level is. I don't care what your background is. Peter and John prove to us that if we are serious about studying the Word and giving the Holy Spirit material within us to work, He can work through us to powerfully and boldly proclaim the Gospel. Continuing on. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, and they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus, by his authority, of his character, of his power. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So, I want to keep our eyes focused on the fact that they're not fighting against what had been done. They can't deny what had been done. They can't deny the change. They can't deny what had happened there. What they are upset about is the preaching of the name of Jesus. Okay? And note that this is the first instance of suffering and persecution in the book of Acts. And with the exception of three chapters, Every chapter in the book of Acts deals with suffering and persecution. Real inspiring book, right? You're going to suffer. You're going to get beat. You're going to get threatened. You're going to get put in jail. You're going to get shipwrecked. You're going to get stoned. You're going to get all these things happen. You're going to get run out of town in a mob. All these things are going to happen so that what? So that the name of Christ will be preached. An early saying amongst the, 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 the church fathers, when the church first started, is, was, man, let me think if I can pull from memory here. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I'm not saying, hey, let's go find a way to all get martyred. Like, I have nothing better to do on my Sunday afternoon than go to another country like North Korea and get killed for the gospel. That's not what I'm saying. But what I want us to know is that suffering is not something that we should avoid. Suffering is something that is a natural part of this fallen world, and it is not something to be avoided. For those of you nerds who want scripture references to back that up, Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, Philippians 1, 29 through 30, James 1, 2 through 4. I'll read those one more time because I see some pens writing furiously. I should see all pens writing furiously. Romans 5, 3 through 5, Philippians 1, 29 through 30, James 1, 2 through 4. Paul and James repeatedly repeatedly expressed that suffering is a blessing. How many of you people, how many of my, and I ask myself this, consider suffering to be a blessing? No way, right? That's insane. I, I, I want to avoid suffering. I want to make myself comfortable. I don't want to deal with these problems. I don't want to deal with trials. I don't want to deal with circumstances. I don't want to deal with things that make me uncomfortable. Suffering cannot be a blessing. But Paul says, 
suffering makes us like Christ. Because Christ first suffered. James says, count it all joy when you fall into trials. How do you count it all joy when you fall into some terrible situation? Unless we understand that that suffering produces something that is far better than our complacency. It's far better than the, the status quo without undergoing that suffering. Would I, would I desire that every one of you went through the experience that I went through in the last year? Absolutely not. I don't want that for anyone. The heartache, the hardship, the struggle, the, the complete confusion of, do I believe anything that I thought I believed? Because I was confident, man. But the point is, looking back now, I would not give up that experience for anything. Because it made Jesus that much more real to me. His, his character, his nature, his goodness, all was made manifest through a time period of, of trial and suffering. So good comes out of these situations. Good comes out of these things that we, we want to avoid. And I mean, in, 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 our, in our day and age, in our culture, we're known as the aspirin generation. I want to take a pill and not have to deal with it. I don't want to struggle. I'll find an easy way out. Like microwave food, right? I don't want to wait 30 minutes for water to boil or spaghetti to be done. I want to pop in my, my ready-made microwavable chicken alfredo. And some of you guys might like microwavable chicken alfredo, but that's not real food. I, mean, I don't care what the, the healthy knives slicing through the green peppers on the commercial says. That stuff's fake. All right? It takes time for good things to come about. All right? Suffering produces patience. Patience produces character. Character produces hope. That's what Paul writes, right? These things are for our good. Even though it don't seem good, and in Romans chapter 8 when he's talking about all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. The context of that whole chapter, and I know, let's take one verse, slap that on my t-shirt, I'm Christian, yeah, I'm on my Christian t-shirt, my scripture. The whole context of that verse, the chapter, that book, your life stinks. You're going to suffer. You're going to go through the worst stuff imaginable, but God is good through everything. No matter what you're suffering. Your father has your back. No matter what trial you're enduring, God is working it towards something better and something good. No matter how terrible, and I never want to downplay it. I never want to downplay people's situations and circumstances. When I say, like, I don't care how terrible it is, I don't mean, like, I don't care. What I mean is it doesn't matter what you're individually going through. God can still make something good because of his love for us. And that's the key. We don't want to avoid necessarily these situations because they will stimulate growth in us as we seek after God. I'm not running towards the, like Paul, you know, historically, Paul ran towards the axe to get beheaded. He's like, oh, are you going to kill me? About time, I'm running towards Christ. Lay my head down right here. I'm not saying we do that. But what I'm saying is I'm not saying we run and cower away from suffering and cower away from trials. And when we're in the midst of it, we don't think, oh man, this is it's all about me, and my life stinks, and you know, God's so unfaithful to me. No, God is so faithful to you. He's so faithful to you, in fact, that he's going to use what you're going through to make you more like Christ. That's how much he loves you. That's how faithful he is. That's how good he is. That he's not willing to leave you where you are, because where you are is not good enough. It's onward to perfection. It's about the process, right? It's about moving towards Christ-likeness. <clears throat> the last thing I want, I want to note here is the relationships that we have with one another in church. The, the family relationship we talked about last week, you know, meeting each other's needs, caring for one another, taking care of one another. These are things that help foster an environment for witnessing. Right? There's a difference between testimony and evangelism. Testimony is what God has done for you personally. I have a different testimony than you have a different testimony, than your family has a different testimony, than your neighbor has a different testimony. We all have different experiences of what God has done individually for us. Evangelism is what God has done for the whole world. That's the same for everybody. Jesus died for you. He was put on the cross because you're a sinner, because you needed saving. Okay? Now, how he interacts differently with each one of us, that's our testimony. <clears throat> And testimonies are great. Testimonies should not replace evangelism. Testimonies should not replace 
evangelism. What I mean by that is when I simply tell people all the good stuff that God did for me, oh, he, he met this need, he provided this job opportunity, he gave me this healing, he did this for that, he did, and we, re, we, we negate to explain that I didn't deserve any of it and I needed a savior to get me out of hell, we're just giving testimony. We need to give testimony coupled with evangelism. I was a sinner. I deserve death. I deserve wrath. I deserve hell. But God, in his grace and love for me, not only saved me, but blessed me. Not only saved me, but turned my life around. Not only saved me, but healed my relationships. Not only did he save me, but, and insert whatever your testimony is, okay? Testimony and evangelism coupled together. When I challenge you, and you challenge me, and we are working together, encouraging one another, get out there. Share your testimony. Share the witness. Share the gospel. Study the scripture. Hey, you know what Ephesians 2, 18 and 19 is talking about? Because I was reading, and God really just spoke to me. The Holy Spirit illuminated this passage. What do you think that 18 and 19 are talking about? What do you think about Romans 8? What do you think about suffering? What do you... We challenge one another. We sharpen one another. We encourage one another so that when the time comes to testify or witness about Jesus, we are ready, we are armed, we are prepared. We can move forward in power to witness about Jesus. And where do we get that power? Holy Spirit, man. He is within each and every one of us. He's within us for a purpose. He's within us to, to empower us to be the church. Amen? Amen. Stand with me, please.